one single solution to this. We need a multi-sectorial solution. Because when a mother dies, it's a systems failure. And in order to get the systems working, we need multiple partners with different strengths. We all have a role to play to keeping that woman safe during what should be the happiest time of her life. So we're also bringing other industry partners and other private sector members to the table to ensure that no woman dies while giving life. The health workers on the ground are the true heroes, very quietly and determinedly going about their work and saving mothers. Good afternoon. I'm Elise Nelson, um, and I suppose my belly and I were the obvious and empathetic choice to moderate this discussion today. In all seriousness, um, I'm thrilled to be here back um, at Women in the World and thrilled to be joined by such an exceptional panel of women who've really dedicated their <coughs> lives to ending maternal deaths in our lifetime. You know, it was just a few months ago when world leaders from more than 200 countries around the globe gathered in this very city, and they assessed where we were in terms of progress on the Millennium Development Goals, and also set forth a very ambitious plan for the next 15 years around the Sustainable Development Goals. And if we looked at progress in terms of where we are for women and girls, unfortunately, what we saw was quite disappointing. And I think that's been played out on this stage throughout the last couple, well, the last day and a half. Whether it be the rise of violence against women around the world, or it be the fact that we are stagnating in terms of women's political participation, or labor force participation has remained flat. But there's one issue, one bright light, where we saw huge progress forward, and that was maternal mortality, that over the last 25 years has been cut in half. However, if you dig just below the surface, I know each of these women would tell you that although we've come far, we've not nearly come far enough. So many of the issues that we've been talking about over the last day are issues that are extremely difficult to solve. And in many cases, we don't really know how to solve them. There are issues that are very much rooted in culture and behavior and changing that, which is extremely difficult. But this issue, in my mind, is something that we can change. And the women that you're going to hear from today have come up with some really innovative solutions, local solutions that are scaling. So let me just quickly introduce them. First, we have Mary um, Masuke. She is often called uh, Mama Maria. She is a midwife in Uganda who, after um, a career in public health in her country, decided to leave and start up her own clinic for maternal health. And we'll talk a little bit more about that to serve rural women throughout her country. Yeah. Leah Kabedi is a supermodel. She is also the founder of the Leah Kabedi uh, Foundation. She has been an incredible advocate for pregnant women around the world, um, and she has won many awards for the work that she's done in this space. Um, next, we have um, Zumbaya Bai, who is um, a social entrepreneur and product designer. She uh, began her career as an engineer and quickly turned um, to creating clean birth kits and saving lives of pregnant women around the world. And finally, uh, Ivy Prosper. She's a journalist and television host um, on maternal health um, in Ghana. Um, so thank you and welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Leah, let's start with you. <laughs> It's, it's interesting to me because really 15 years ago, this was so much of a silent issue. You just didn't hear about maternal health, even as part of the global women's agenda. And what I wonder if you can give us um, just, you know, the framework of this issue more broadly around the world and how you've seen these issues impact um, families and communities globally. 
Um, <clears throat> I think when I, when I first started working uh, as an advocate for maternal health, it was about 10 years ago, shockingly, even to myself. Um, I started working as a goodwill ambassador for the WHO. And at the time, I, I had my two children. Uh, I'm from Ethiopia, I was born and raised in Ethiopia. And uh, growing up in Ethiopia, hearing of women dying in childbirth was the most common thing ever. Everybody knows a mother who died from childbirth. Every time you heard of somebody who was pregnant and was gonna deliver, you sort of cringed a little because you thought, will she make it? Is she gonna come back? Is the baby gonna be okay? It was a very common thing. Um, I had the opportunity to have my children here in New York, and even to me, who came here and had my children here, uh, I remember sort of worrying about childbirth because it was a worrying subject, you know, to be here. Here, no one really worries about giving birth because everything is available. You have an amazing facility, you have great doctors or midwives. Um, you go in for prenatal checkups, you, you find out if, you want, if you're having a boy or a girl. I mean, the gap is huge. In, in places like Ethiopia or um, other African countries, when a woman is pregnant, you actually reminded me of my quote, it is said that you have one foot in the grave. So you're already thinking about whether you're gonna make it or not. And the sad situation is these women are dying not because we don't know how to save them, um, because they're all dying from very simple conditions that are either treatable or preventable. They're li most likely dying from infection or hemorrhaging or the baby is too big and she needs a C-section. And most, in most cases, these women are, live in rural areas. They deliver in, in their huts. There's no running water. There's no electricity. They don't have any kind of skilled um, attendant or healthcare worker around them. They usually are, uh, have their babies being delivered by the neighborhood um, woman who helps everybody else. And if there is any kind of complication, by the time they say, oh, let's go to the hospital, it's already too late. And most women actually die doing transportation to the hospital, which probably is located really far away. And so um, this is basically uh, what the whole maternal mortality means. You know, we, when a woman dies in giving birth, first of all, what we have to remember is most of these women are actually young girls. You know, in most places, girls start, you know, having babies very young, and they're young, they, they don't have access to any kind of uh, help, and um, we're cutting their lives really short by things that possibly could have been treated or prevented. Leo, one of the things that I have heard quite a bit um, about is that there was great progress for a number of years in reducing the number of, um, of deaths, but then we've been stagnating over the last couple of years. And what I wonder is, does that have anything to do with you know, the rise of you know, global health epidemics like Ebola or the refugee crisis um, or, you know, or other humanitarian crises? Does, do those take precedence over issues like this? I think when you look at things like maternal mortality, it is an issue that's been going on since the beginning of time, basically. You know, women dying in childbirth, it's not a new um, issue. Um, it's been hap it, it used to happen even here until finally we got all the hospitals and everybody gets you know, access to healthcare. So it's an issue that's been going on forever. Mostly the problem is um, a priority issue. It's a willingness of governments and international donors to invest in women's health. Basically, that's what you know, pulls this development back. Mm. Um, and um, when you look at the first Millennium Development Goals, one of the issues that really did not do very, even though to your, I don't wanna bust your bubble when you said, you know, one of the issues that did really well is maternal mortality. Yes and no. At the same time, when you look at those goals, one of the issues that did not really progress very well is maternal mortality. And most countries were not reaching the goals that they had put forth. And now there's a new one, and it's even more aggressive, as you said. Yeah. Um, and until we really address the issue of having access for women. I mean, when I mean access, it doesn't mean every woman has to have a doctor, but she should at least have a midwife yeah. or a skilled 
uh, attendant who can actually give her the, the, the simple low-cost solutions that she needs just to survive, you know, and then she can go to the more complicated situation. So you started your foundation 11 years ago. Um, that's, that's, I mean, that was right at the beginning, I think, when people were really starting to pay attention. How did you, how did you begin that, that journey of starting your foundation? Um, I, I, when I first started actually uh, advocating for maternal mortality, it happened uh, in, because the WHO was uh, wa looking for someone to be an ambassador to this issue because no one was talking about it. And no one was talking about it because it was not a new issue. It's an issue that has always, again, been you know, happening. Um, and since then, I think uh, it's been nice to see now that it's actually uh, being addressed in, in a big way and there has been a reduction of maternal mortality. Um, I started the foundation because as I was working with the WHO as an advocate, uh, I realized that most people who heard of the issue wanted to get involved and the WHO did not really have uh, a solution for the public to get involved in a way on any programs or any solutions because the WHO works from government to government. And so I thought that I wanted to extend what I was already doing with them and uh, start a foundation to invest in programs. We work mostly on um, training actually healthcare workers um, and we want to have more healthcare workers out there working. Um, there's a big um, poster out there I think from Merck that says that uh, one midwife uh, can help 500 women a year. Um, I don't know what anybody here, uh, as one person, that we d something that we do that can actually help 500 women a year. That's yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, save lives, certainly. And, save, and you're actually saving lives, yeah. So Mary, let's, let's turn to you as our resident midwife here. Yeah. Um, in fact, we were missing her backstage, and I said, we can't go on stage without our midwife. <laughs> um, so. Tell me, you, you began your career um, in Uganda as a health services worker, and then you left public health to start up your own clinic um, for maternal services. How, how did that happen? Why did you decide to leave, start up your own? My idea, it was a challenging story, because you know in most of the African settings in hospitals, as you've had, a ratio of uh, mothers to midwife is very high. I used to work in what they call a national referral hospital. And we, a woman, when she enters such a, a, a facility, she's expecting the best. But sometimes you could uh, see that a mother delivers herself. A mother can deliver herself on the floor. I used to feel so bad. Then I decided, because where, I, where my home is, mothers used, let me say, to disturb me because they knew I was a midwife within that community. They could come, Mama, can you examine me? Can you do this? Then one time, as the mother came in, she delivered in my sitting room. My husband said, what is happening? Is this a hospital now? <laughs> then after that, there are so many reasons why I had to leave. Because I realized a lot of need is needed at the community level. Because at least when you are in a hospital, there are so many others who can look after you. But in the community, you are left to fellow women, whether they know, whether whatever, and the baby doesn't wait. She can, for example, when you go in labor, you can even deliver from a stage. <laughs> so I said I have to go back where I need is. And these mothers at the community, they also need quality services. Because most of the midwives who are working at the community level are the least trained with a certificate. Most of the high trained are found in hospitals. By then, I had a diploma. I had also finished my diploma. I said, I'm resigning. Everybody said, Mary, you are running crazy. When they are soon promoting you and you are going back, 
where I'm going back, the husband is also curious. Because when I said, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm resigning, he said, you're resigning. Where shall we get money to look after these children? Mm -hmm. But time came when he was given an opportunity to go outside China. And, uh, and he, he authorized me to get his salary. I said, thank God, let me use this chance. I went and hired a small room, just a single room. Mm. Then I said, I'm going to deliver mothers from this room, other than delivering them from the, the, what, the, the, the sitting rooms and what have you. So you started in a single room, it's and you've expanded dramatically. And yes. I want to know, how, I know Merck for Mothers and Pace have been incredible supporters of yours. And I'd love to know, what, what did they do for you? How did they really help you to grow? My dear, this is great. Because <laughs> when uh, I left, uh, I didn't have any business. So you see, you go in, you don't know whether you are going to sustain the clinic. But thank to Pace, they, are, they, they give us trainings. I had to go through certain trainings whereby you have to learn emergence of obstetrical care, where then you can prevent the, the, the bleeding, she was telling you. You can deliver difficult deliveries. You learn, so we went through that, and we, each midwife was attached to a gynecologist, whereby you just get free consultation. Hello, doctor, I'm here. I'm stranded with this, and it was a free. That was so tremendous because once you are in the community, you are everything, whether you would manage or not. And that one helped me so much. At the same time, they took us through business management. That's when I realized because I, I had a challenge. How can I learn this? Because most of the mothers are poor. But at the same time, I used to get mothers who are well off. They could compensate for the poor ones, and I ran the clinic. At the same time, I realized that I, I needed, they gave us a lot of skills to run a business. And that, as I talk now, uh, I have already uh, approved the plan for, for a maternity, a better maternity unit, whereby I'm saying I'm coming from a bicycle to, to run a, an airplane. Because from one small single room, I'm going to deliver so many mothers from that God willing. I'm no, I know where I have been a rich there. And the mothers at the community level which also have quality services. Because even if you are poor, you need something good. Even if you are poor, you are not entitled to bleed to death. So I'm so happy that they are giving us a lot of skills and knowledge, not only in maternal health, but even to run the business. Mm. And oh, I'm sounds hoping, very comprehensive. Yeah, and I'm hoping it, will, it is going to be a model maternity home in my country. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I mean, you go into villages, um, in Ghana and really tried to tell these stories. And you, through your, um, your maternal health show, channel, um, you're able to reach, what, seven million viewers? Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to show a quick clip of your, of your show. As you saw from the clip, the um, show is part reenactment yes. um, of real events and also some studio interviews. Tell me, what are the, the core issues um, and what's been the impact of the show? 
Well, definitely the impact is huge, as you said, seven million viewers, and that's just on television because it's also on radio as well into oh, wow. communities where they don't have access to TV. Um, but media is very powerful. Telling the stories of um, the local people and what they're experiencing is it's fascinating. You get to see that, like some of the things Leo was saying, it's very similar issues in Ghana where the access to a midwife or access to a doctor, access to facilities are just not there. And a lot of Ghanaians say the same thing of one foot in the grave and one foot out when you're pregnant. Um, so I saw a lot of things like um, electricity and water are serious problems across the country uh, as far as um, maternal health is concerned. And education, a lot of people are not understanding the importance of going in for prenatal or antenatal care while you're pregnant so you can spot issues like high blood pressure, um, a lot of risks that you may have because of health issues that may be underlying that can cause the problems later on down the road. Um, hemorrhaging, uh, excessive bleeding are major causes of, of maternal mortality in Ghana, as well as nutrition is an issue as well. People don't necessarily take the extra step to take care of themselves while they are pregnant, which can lead to problems with, with delivery. So have you heard from people that, you know, after watching your show, you know, they're, they're, they made different choices? Yeah, people made different choices and also people in positions of power could make changes as well. So there was a community where um, there was um, a gate in between um, the hospital and one community is on one side, another community is on the other and this company has a gate and they lock it at 10 o'clock at night every day. And so a gentleman and his wife, you know, they came to the gate, she, was, she just delivered her baby, she was bleeding excessively, she needed medical care and the, the security guard at the gate said, no, he can't open the gate, it's locked for security reasons, he can't open it for anyone. And they begged for a long time before he finally opened the gate and at that point, by the time they got across and got to the hospital, she had lost so much blood, she ended up dying. The baby survived, but she ended up dying and when it came to air, you know, government officials, a person in the Supreme Court had said, this should not be happening. Why is the gate being locked? Why aren't people being let through when there's an emergency situation? Wow. So little things like that, well, not little, but major things happen when the show aired and people were saying, wow, this is happening here in Ghana? I can't believe it. So, so it definitely has an impact on, wow. on how people yeah. behave. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I was just shocked to learn that the statistics here in the United States have actually gotten worse. Yes, they have. More maternal They death. have. Uh, the United States is the only country that is a developed country that maternal mortality is actually increasing now. Whereas in developed country, developing countries that are having problems, you're seeing small decreases. Yeah. There's still a, a bigger problem in developed countries that developing countries than there are here in the U.S. But um, that shouldn't be happening here in a country like this. That's for sure. So, Bida, how did you how did you get engaged in this issue? I mean, as I said, you're an engineer. That's where you started your career, and then now you're making clean, affordable birth kits. What was the experience that led you to, to make such a dramatic shift? I think for me, I was always a product developer, um, and that's what I did for a living, even as an engineer. Um, and there was this point in my life where we were working with a lot of rural innovations, but none of them were going to the market. And uh, one of the reasons that people gave was people are not going to pay for it. Right? And I think I came out of my job with a philosophy that the poor are not poor in mind. They are going to pay for things that they can or they believe is going to impact their lives in some way. Um, and I think I was so passionate about women and wanted to do something with women's health and I ended up just traveling, meeting organizations and people and there was this particular instance where I was just talking about women's health and somebody just pointed me to this midwife who was sitting there and she was just talking to me about how she would deliver babies. And here she picked up this grass cutting tool from under the bed and said, this is what we use to cut the umbilical cord. Oh my God. And that was basically the moment of my life where the world went blank and I was like, there's something really wrong in what I'm seeing. Um, and that kind of led me to explore and understand, are there problems with using a sickle? Um, and infection was wow. definitely one that my mind was bringing up. And I, as a mother who gave birth in one of the best institutions in India, did have an infection post-childbirth. And so for me, it was like I just couldn't take what I was seeing. Uh, and that led to the discovery of clean birth kits and the concept of it, which has been in existence for really long. The funny part was when I was trying to buy one, I couldn't. 
right? So the instinct was, let's buy and make it available, but that wasn't. Um, and so we ended up developing our own clean birth kit with my product development experience. What came about was we make the product attractive to women. And we started with the vision of actually bringing simplicity and dignity to women's health. And there we were, uh, that we ended up creating a product that women would pay and buy. Mm. So you're not only saving lives, you're also creating jobs. That's right. What's been the impact of your product? <coughs> How many lives have you impacted? Um, so I think we started in 2012, and as of March this year, we have about 270,000 kits out in the market, so a little over a quarter of a million. <laughs> and it's kind of surprising because when we started off, people were like, you're never going to create a business of a $3 product, right? And here we are talking just between India and Africa, the 60 million births. Right? Even if you cut it into half, if I had 30 million women buying my product at $2 a piece, it was 60 million in annual revenue. It was basic common sense. We do understand that there are challenges in scaling and that it's taken longer than a, than a typical enterprise to scale, but I think we are at a point where we do understand there is a lot of need around maternal neonatal health, like postpartum hygiene. Right? Like nobody talks about it, and that's a big issue that we're trying to tackle now. So um, I definitely think that we believe that there is a lot of need out there, and, and we need to scale much faster with many more products that are low cost um, to get there. And we can be a business, and we do believe that women, if educated and if given um, the access, would buy the product for $2. Mm. Yeah, um, you've been working on this issue for a while. What have you seen that's really working? What's been, what's, what's been successful? <clears throat> I think, um, you know, in Ethiopia there is the Health Extension Workers Program, which I think uh, basically closes the gap between uh, the mother who's delivering and her access to a hospital and a doctor. Um, I think women who have been, who have the chance to be followed by a, a skilled healthcare attendant uh, in their villages, for example. You know, um, in Ethiopia, what they, what they did was they developed these young girls who have had some kind of an education in simple um, um, delivering skills and checking, you know, the, 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 the priority or necessary um, problems or making sure that, for example, if they think, oh, there may be uh, an issue with this pregnancy, advising the women to be closer to a hospital, for example, or uh, taking all the, um, the, you know, the measurements and, and, you know, just some sort of a prenatal checkup and ch making sh seeing who's pregnant, who's delivering, just those simple things um, make a huge difference in, in a mother's life. Also, just for her to have somebody that she knows from her village coming in and talking with her and explaining the situation to her. Because also what you have to realize is most women don't see uh, like we do. The minute we are pregnant here, for example, the first thing you think about is, oh, let me get my doctor and I'm going to deliver in this hospital. And you're already planning that. You, for you, going to the hospital, you don't even have to think about it. Uh, f for most women in developing nations, they never think about going to the hospital. That's not the first thing that comes to their mind at all. The only reason why they go to the hospital is when they are at, they're delivering and there's something goes wrong. And so for most women, going to the hospital is almost bad news because most of them don't come back because it's already too late. Um, so there is a whole work to be done around educating women and, and, and teaching them that actually for them, the minute they, they, they're, they're pregnant, they have to already start planning and thinking about going to the hospital, thinking about going to the healthcare worker who will be uh, following, following them through the whole pregnancy mm -hmm. to make sure that they're okay. So these kind of simple, you know, solu they're quite, it's quite a simple solution, not to mention it's also uh, giving employment to young girls who come out of school, um, you know, for the, for the health extension workers. These kind of simple solutions, I feel like, uh, have a really huge impact on the life of a, of a woman when you're uh, pregnant and delivering. Hmm. Mary, I want to give you the last word because you're really in the trenches. Yeah. Um, are you optimistic? I mean, you hear these big goals that the UN and many countries around the world have put forth about you know, decreasing maternal mortality. Are you optimistic about the future? Yeah, because I think that's why we are trying, because we can't 
reduce the maternal mortality as health or as health workers alone because this needs to be multisectoral. That's why I need to bring on board husbands, wife, community, and what have you. Because, for example, in my country, the, ma the, ma the maternal mortality rate has been stagnant for s mm. a good time of time. So, to me, I believe that we need to work together so that we bring down this maternal mortality. Because if uh, the husband is not aware that a mother is supposed to deliver from a hospital, he doesn't see the need why his wife should go for family planning. Mm. So it, they will continue having the eighth, the ninth, the twelfth, and then in the long run, the mother will, of course, die due to bleeding. So. We are trying, I'm calling upon, oh, because what my friends are doing here, I think that is great. Because together as women, we can fight and bring down the maternal mortality, which has been a challenge for most of the countries. Well, thank you, and thank you all for the incredible work you're doing. Thank you.